I don't know if it's ironic or just on brand for 2022 to have so many sequels rolling out, but that trend hasn't slowed down even going into summer. So are we looking at a dumpster fire roasting in the summer heat, or an oasis under the sun? In order to figure that out, I had to pick shows, so I used my usual method. Filing a bunch of court cases with show names as the plaintiff, and whichever made it all the way up to the Supreme Court to overturn decades of legal precedent, were my winners. My apologies. I didn't realize it'd get so bad. As consolation, I ended up with a hell of a roster, though. Kanajo Okadishimasu's second season is back to see if we can handle a long, hard look in the mirror for a chance to see cute girls. A1 Pictures hands us Lacorus Recoil, where the cute girl's secret police cleans up society's undesirables. Engage Kiss asks how to juggle all these waifus when drowning in credit card debt. Yure Deco's about kids solving a hacking minigame to get to the bottom of a mystery. What are weaponized androids to do after their reason to exist comes to an end? Open a cafe, of course, and Prima Doll. Overlord is back for its fourth season. So, uh, let's see how Ayn's gangs the noobs this art. Did you think Joshin Chan was done after two seasons of largely running the same joke into the ground? Think again, because here's the third. Mama Haha no Tsurego Motokano Data has two kids who used to date now stuck as brother and sister to justify their hatred of each other. Lead in film shows us what if Harry Potter was actually about a rich all girls school with Warao Ars Notorious Soon. Isekai oji san answers what happens after the hero returns from an isekai. Maiden Abyss is back to piss off more parents who accidentally showed it to their kids on Disney+. Plus. Kumicho Musume to Sewagakari is a heartwarming story about a criminal taking care of a little girl. To fill the void Kaguya left in our hearts, Sore Demo Ayumu wa Yosete Kuru has our pointless back and forth building to a romance confession cover. Hoshino Same Dare is about a guy at odds with his companion when she wants to end the world after saving it. Giving you even more reasons to not trust strangers, Yofukashi no Uta has a guy giving up on life to become a vampire. And lastly, a sequel almost a decade in the making finally makes it to air, with the long-awaited return of Hataraku Maosama. Kicking things off is 2020's darling Kanojo Okadishimasu, or Rent-A-Girlfriend. When a loser desperate enough for human affection contracts a girl to pretend to be his girlfriend, but due to a series of coincidences, he introduces her to his family and finds out she's also living next door, so they have to pretend to date to smooth things over. This season continues the convoluted mess of girls vying for the main guy's attention, which people have really enjoyed. I had some pretty harsh criticisms for this show, mostly because I couldn't stand the protagonist for being an indecisive, scummy creep, cry-bullying his way into these girls' lives. But I think the core premise works well enough for the usual rom-com shenanigans, as the two leads work their way towards a real relationship. So the question is, how does this follow-up do? Well, the first episode picks up pretty much right where the franchise left off, and it's not missing a beat with the plot, feeling like the last two years have been a gap between cores rather than separate seasons. While it gives a quick recap of the characters and how they relate, I'd probably recommend re-watching the first season for a refresher. The draw for this series isn't so much the chemistry between the cast, but the main romantic interest themselves for the horny otaku audience, and that's not changing. The animation is still on point for this anime, as it's always had this distinct style feeling like the manga panels were brought to life. Using the same framing and presentation of the text to convey that flow, with a genuine hand-drawn feel. With that said, fans are already watching, so will this season bring more viewers in? Hard to tell, but I'm not a fan of this style of humor and the first episode reminded me just how cringy it is. Check it out, if you're into a guy embarrassing himself by consistently swinging above his weight class. Speaking of cute girls being the draw, let's look at LaCorus Recoil next. This one's about some orphans taken in by a secret organization, trained to do all kinds of crazy work, and then stationed at a cafe to accept missions ranging from simple deliveries to stopping world-ending threats. So given that off-the-wall premise and distinct lack of a comedy tag, what does that mean we're left with? Well, the series leaning pretty hard into the disconnect between the positive narrative and pretty gruesome work the cast does. Like the opening juxtaposes a happy-go-lucky monologue with upbeat music about how peaceful Japan is and that peace is upheld by the citizens, as a group of roving schoolgirls pop up and execute terrorists and thwart attacks, all before they take place. But it seems like the heart of this series isn't so much the world-saving angle, but more how on the street the core cast is, as they're the face of their organization to the public doing good in their community, and that's what's giving this first episode an edge. The action is tense with some nice animation backing it up, showing they threw some budget into it. For an action series, we certainly could have done worse, especially since it handles its story well. By feeding relevant material to the audience with a measured pace to ensure they're following the series' plot, rather than dumping everything on us at the start. 
So definitely check this out if you're looking for a renegade spy thriller type show. Wrapped with cute anime girls, of course. Let's stick with A1 Pictures for this next feature, Engage Kiss. This one takes place on a floating city in the ocean where a guy runs a small business and blows through his money like nobody's business. But a high school girl swings by, cooks his dinners, and helps him out with his work. But his ex isn't quite over him yet either, and she's helping him out too. So what's that leave us with? A slightly disturbing love triangle between a guy, a high school girl, and his ex where he's using them? Oh, I'm sure that comedy tag will save us from the wave of cancellation cries pouring out from Twitter. But that's not the sole thing this is about, because what's this whole business he runs? And, more importantly, what's with that supernatural tag hanging over this anime? Well, it turns out they're demon hunters, of course, who bid to take down monsters causing a ruckus. And that's pretty much the hook to set this aside from any other random series you're watching. So does it handle that aspect well? Not really, because it's a little confused in its execution. Between the VR bid wars, random city in the middle of the ocean, and the whole demons existing thing feels almost superfluous to the main draw this series is going for, you know, the cat fight between the two Lee girls over the main dude? Considering it holds all the sci-fi and fantasy shit off to the middle point of the episode, it comes out of left field. This definitely could have been handled better, because honestly, the romance shit feels petty and gross. All while the action feels completely disjointed from the rest of the story. So, nothing really gels here. While the action scenes look fine, I can tell how their budget was worked with them because it's only going to get lazier from this point going on. Hard to say watch because nothing really screams pick this up over anything else. But I guess if you want a non-slice of life romance story with demon battles instead of high school, maybe grab this. I'm a sucker for Science Saru these days, and their newest show dropped onto our laps as Yure Deco. So in a Mark Twain reference, an average girl meets a boyish girl named Hack, and the two delve into the digital soup that is the inner workings of this city to find out about the mysterious Zero, an underground figure key to learning the truth about the city Tom Sawyer. Yeah, that was the reference. I think this works well to establish what this series is about quickly, by throwing us the basic premise, why the main girl is so interested, as well as showing us why this world is intriguing, by showing us what a world constantly plugged into VR, social media, and the internet could look like realistically with people logging in to work in virtual spaces, or how life becomes essentially an ARG, which leads into the art style for the show, with a really sharp color palette to draw the overlay into focus, where what's actually there has a more realistic coloring. But things in virtual reality are pastel, cartoonish, and blending these things with the cast adds a ton of personality to the show, even breaking its own style to use different animation methods to emphasize the shift in tone. The plot's fairly light, but what the anime is showing us is a world, and I think it's definitely doing that well, by saying, hey, here's some goofy characters living their life, one that's a fairly exaggerated version of our own, and also trying to solve a fun mystery. And for that, I think it's got charm and a ton of personality. Check it out for some laid-back sci-fi fun. Next up is Key's latest anime with Prima Doll. So when a war broke out, humanity did the most logical thing, and made weaponized androids that look like cute high school girls. However, now that the war is over, what are they gonna do? Having no purpose, we're following a small group of them as they start a cafe to find a new way of life. Off the bat, there's a decent amount thrown at the audience, but it's not overwhelming. I like the steampunk aesthetic mixed with Taisho era Japan, but ultimately that's just window dressing to lower the cost of buying into the suspension of disbelief. The nitty gritty of this story feels a bit muddled, like there's a big disconnect between the cute girl flipping pancakes and the Bioshock cameo charging at a different little girl randomly, when these two events are separated by like, a minute tops. Yeah, tonal whiplash in the first episode doesn't really set the audience up for success in the long haul. It feels too heavy at times for Slice of Life, and those heavier elements are interesting enough on their own that the lighter stuff feels distracting. I guess I think the characters work well enough in a Moe Blob sense, and given their designs, it'll certainly gain some traction. Which leads me into the animation for this show. It's good. Really attractive models that pop with color, design, and still mesh well in the sense that everything feels cohesive, on top of some well-animated moments that put this on the better end of the spectrum. I feel like this could be more interesting if it wanted to, but the project seems more interested in playing it safe. Watch if you want a good-looking slice of life story with some mild sci-fi elements. Oh boy, Overlord's fourth season is finally here after a four-year hiatus. But I guess for those of you who don't know, in the far-flung future of 2125, deep dive MMOs are a reality, and a particular one at the end of its life sends the last player logged in into an alternate reality. Now he's searching for anyone who knows anything about his predicament, but being an undead lich means he doesn't have much humanity left in him. 
so now he's mostly just spreading his influence to make the name of his once feared guild, Heinz Ulgaon, known far and wide in this new world. Heinz has been on a number of adventures already, and season 4 is continuing with volume 10 of the light novels. So after the big battle, killing the best soldier in the kingdom, and securing himself a new base of operations, what's this season going to focus on? Establishing the new Sorcerer Kingdom with Heinz at its center, of course, and that's been long awaited by fans. I feel Overlord is a great mix of hype fights with obvious outcomes, and a dark air about it, since the main character is actually pretty damn evil, giving it an edge. Is a series watching essentially the typical hero's tale from the other end, where the bad guy is the big imposing force in the world, but also it knows how to chill, and show the softer sides of its core cast to make them more rounded. The animation for this season feels like it's improved quite a bit. <laughs> Maybe Madhouse has just burnt out, churning out three seasons of this franchise back to back until 2018, and this break was necessary to get them back on their game. But the artwork, lighting, angles, and colors just feel more polished than previous seasons. If you're a fan, you're already watching this, obviously. But if you're not, Overlord is pretty much the only villain isekai that's done well. And the fact that it's four seasons in shows that it has staying power. Let's keep the sequel train rolling with Joshin Chan Dropkick's third outing. It's pretty hard to summarize this show, since it's an absurdist slice of life comedy that breaks the fourth wall pretty hard, and only cares about its premise insofar as it allows untold misery to be unleashed upon its cast. But uh, in case you do care, a demon was summoned by a witch on a whim to the human world, and is now stuck there because they can't find the spell to send her home. So now she's crashing at this girl's place, with her demonic friends and angels popping in to spice up her boring existence. But the typical jokes here revolve around Joshin Chan trying to kill Urine to break her contract so she can go home. But she fails, obviously, and gets mutilated as a form of retribution. So what's this season about? That obviously, just more of it. So the real question then is, does that get old? And I guess the answer to that depends on if you decided to pick up season 3 or not in the first place. Because if you did, it certainly didn't get old now, did it? I've already poked fun at this series for running its one joke into the ground, and it's certainly planning to keep digging at this rate, but in that is a strange charm, that this franchise isn't betraying its ideals. So let me rephrase this, and say if you like dark humor, like accidents or dumb comments leading to gruesome torture and maiming, then this is right up your alley. <laughs> Let's take a short break from all the continuations, with Mama Haha no Tsurigo. So a guy used to date a girl in middle school, but they drifted apart and broke up. But now that he's in high school, his dad's remarrying, and it turns out it's to his ex's mom, which means they're now step-siblings living under the same roof. So they devise a little game to keep this whole situation family-friendly. By whoever doesn't treat the other like family first, loses. The loser becomes the younger sibling and is forced to be humiliated. That's hard when you're living together, commuting, and going to the same school, especially when you used to be an item. So how is it? A lot of bickering about stupid things behind the parents' back because they don't know that they used to date, and that little fact could rock their happy little family bow. So the real question then is, is that grating? And it's really not, as the two leads are not just nerdy bookworms, but pedantic and petty too, leading to hell grudges over stupid stuff that comes in on the comical side of this situation. Knowing how to push each other's buttons gives this game a back and forth element as they come to terms with their new life and past, and I think it's got some potential to be a good romance, especially since it's clear they still harbor some feelings for one another. By a middling studio that typically relies on colors and pretty models to carry its work visually, it's surprising how well this gels. Then again, their last few shows have been on the better end of the average spectrum, so we'll see how this handles in the future. But for now, it's fairly plain in its presentation with passable direction. Check it out for some serious sibling rivalry. Oh hey, for longtime viewers, I'm sure you know what this is about, but if you're new here, you're probably confused. Maybe you just got an ad break, or maybe you didn't. Either way, on to the rest of the video. Next up is Arsh Notorious Soon, our obligatory cute girls doing a thing show. This time it's a fancy boarding school of magic as we follow their fun daily lives. Now let me check this here, uh, yeah, it really stresses fun in the description. We're following five girls packed with capital P personality through their school lives to become proper ladies. Then again, this is an anime based off a game, so we're probably not getting a ton of plot anyway. Speaking of, I'm getting a lot of Ghibli vibes in terms of storytelling, and that's actually not a compliment. Where some stories throw everything at you all at once, drowning their audience, or pepper in tidbits to draw viewers in, this one shows the route of not explaining shit about its world, and just rolling with it like any other slice of life out there. 
Who are these characters and why should I care about them? Also, maybe don't slap a card on screen for less than a second that defines a fairly important term in the conversation? All on top of character archetypes that would have been considered boring by early 2000s standards for anime group dynamics. We have all the classics here. Get the fuck out of my face. I'm sorry, could you speak up? Voted most likely to be forgotten on a field trip. Asshole so tight it could turn cold to diamonds. And blah blah blah, I wasn't listening. Yeah, a forgettable cast with the least memorable sharing the most standout character design. Lovely. And whatever plot it teased at the end was just too little too late. So, Leiden Films is behind this. A studio with a pretty shoddy track record of decent work for a bit, before absolutely shitting the bed on the rest of the season. And damn if they didn't pull out all the stops on this first episode, showing what they can do when they really throw their backs behind a series. It's downright beautiful at times. My only issue is, why this one? It's okay, I'm sure it won't last. I don't really want to be harsh on this series, but it fails at things that should be easy, and then has the balls to look good doing so. I guess watch this if you're really fiending for some slice of life moe blob shit, otherwise give it a pass. It's been a while since I've talked about a new isekai, so let's look at what my miserable trek will finally look like when it's all over, with isekai Oji-san. So a guy got whisked away to a fantasy world, solved whatever problem took him there, and was sent home years later. 17 years passed in our world and the guy wakes up from the coma he was in, so now he's living with his nephew, but also some of that other world mojo carried over, as he still has his magic powers. Time to catch this otaku loser up on the last two decades of pop culture. So flat out, this is a comedy. It goes to great lengths to poke fun at not just the genre, but rather the stale tropes the genre recycled endlessly to the point that they became cliches. From a truck coon fake out, everyone treating him like he's basically a mental patient is damn funny because, from an outside perspective, you'd assume a 17 year long coma caused some brain damage or something, to even saying how ugly he was compared to the people in the other world. As a comedy, it's pretty damn successful to someone so jaded by what Isekai has become, seeing the mentally stunted man-child return home, finding his life is in shambles, so he's learning everything that's happened and rebuilding. Though the kid turning his uncle into a YouTube sensation with his real magic powers is pretty damn smart. All the bad shit happening to this dude is pretty much what you assume happens anyway, so it's a solid parody. But on that front, I'm not sure it has the staying power to remain fresh for a whole season, so rot may set in quick. As for the animation, this is by a new studio with a first-time director, a seasoned series composer versed in isekai, and an animation director with a strong pedigree. So that's why this is probably decently animated, even if the models aren't the most attractive. This has a ton of potential to be a good comedy, and the first episode did pretty well to get laughs. Next up is the second season of Maiden Abyss. So, uh, did you watch Dawn of the Deep Soul? If not, you've got some homework, as that covered a pivotal arc in the story. So yeah, the season continues right after that, as Riko, Nanachi, and Reg venture into the deadly sixth layer of the abyss. This is the point of no return, as once you've entered the sixth layer, going up far enough either triggers death or horrible mutations. But what's really the main point of this season is discovering the mystery of the Golden City, the Narahate Village, their mysterious murder-happy princess, who Reg actually is, and the stories of those who have come before. Where Dawn of the Deep Soul was just pretty dark, this arc in the story really encapsulates that cutesy horror made in Abyss is known for, with designs reminiscent of children's cartoons wallowing in body horror and mutilation, all with the express purpose of showing just how horrible it can get. Not just by how everything is out to kill our cast, but how haunting the landscapes can be in the sixth layer. I've been looking forward to this adaptation for a while, and it's definitely in top form. If you're a fan of Made in Abyss, obviously watch it. But if you're not familiar, it's a story full of heart and optimism, despite how uncaring the world can be, wrapped in a cutesy aesthetic. So definitely check it out. Speaking of something cute, how about a heartwarming babysitting story with Kumicho Musume to Sewa Gakari? So one dude is the right-hand man of a crime family who loves kicking ass and taking names. That is until his boss hands him a new assignment, babysitting his daughter. Basically, we're left with the least qualified person helping to raise a little girl, and comedy is meant to ensue. On the surface, this seems like an awful idea, but it's an anime. Which means it's going to be about a little girl slowly infecting these hardened mob types around her with happiness to the point that they soften up. Emotionally, not physically. The point of the boss assigning her is that she's meant to instill a sense of responsibility in the guy because he's a loose cannon, but also he'll keep her safe. But double also, maybe she'll come out of her shell. So how does it fare on the comedy end? Not well. It's not bad or anything, but it's more moments that register as jokes, 
but don't really get a laugh or even a smirk. Most of it is coming from the casual threats of empty violence between Yakuza and juxtaposition with the hardened mobster types of softer features and music. Helmed by two middling studios and a director past his prime with a hell of a portfolio, I'm expecting it to end up right down the center, especially given the animation is the typical polished slice of life stuff that can't really be bothered to visually engage the audience. Though it is sweet enough that maybe that'll pull it across the finish line, but if you're looking for comedy, this isn't it. Definitely will resonate more with Slice of Life fans. So are you tired of Slice of Life? Too bad. Sore demo aimu wa yosete kuru is our high school rom-com variety. So a boy joins the shogi club at school with its one other member, and he ends up crushing on her pretty hard. However, he won't confess his feelings until he bests her in a match to prove himself. Sad thing is, the girl likes him back, and is waiting for him to grow a pair. Alright, so we have our fan favorites here. The stone-faced stoic male with his chronically blushing senpai a bit on the spunky side, crushing on each other ad nauseum until something finally breaks. In say 11 or 12 episodes. The thing here is, it's not really a secret that he has a crush on her. Because it's fucking obvious. But she doesn't know the self-imposed rule he's got in place. So basically he's just being an asshole turning down her advances because he's stubborn. So why did that work in something like Kaguya but not here? Because in that, both people were playing by that rule to further their own narcissism. Here it just comes off as cringy, because these characters clearly have nothing to lose. So let's talk humor, because this is predominantly a comedy. The guy says a thing that's pretty damn bold with a straight face, and the girl gets flustered. Rinse and repeat. I don't want to imply that this series isn't good, because it's passable for a slice of life rom-com, but it certainly didn't blow me away with its debut, to the point that it's not even worth talking about the animation. So, check it out if you're into slow-paced school romance. Next up is Hoshino Samidare. A random college kid finds a talking lizard one day, who tells him a wizard from a parallel dimension is about to blow up the earth with a magic... not space laser, a fucking hammer I guess. Unless he and a princess put a stop to it. Too bad she's only stopping the crazy space wizard from destroying the planet because she wants to herself, thus leading to the core struggle of this series. Will our college dude be completely pussy-whipped, or save the world? Only time will tell. So yeah, this is a little more grown-up version of your typical shonen battle manga. In fact, the genre is called seinen, with fights, superpowers, saving the world and such. But the real thing here is how absolutely abysmal the anime is. <laughs> like the voice actors sound disinterested, the animation is distractingly bad. Yeah, I found myself laughing at it rather than watching the show. And I genuinely feel bad for fans of the manga. So, big question time. Is a garbage adaptation of a beloved manga a way to bring in new fans? No, it's not. In fact, it'll piss off current fans and not sell shit outside the hardcore audience who's mostly in it to support their favorite creators. If you're looking for an action series this season, this probably isn't it. Since the romance stories have been mostly dud so far, let's look at Yofukashi no Uta. This one's about a guy living a pretty normal life, until he just says fuck it and stops. Screw school and social obligations, right? They suck. So now he spends his nights unable to sleep and wandering without much purpose. That is, until he comes across this weird girl who tells him he needs to start living his life to the fullest, and invites him back to her place. While normally that would just mean waking up in an ice bath without a kidney at worst, she ends up taking a bite out of his neck because that girl turns out to be a vampire. So there's a strong message of teenage rebellion in this one. That's a theme that's like a dime a dozen in anime, but it resonates stronger here because it shows this vague sense of purpose in it. And I like that, because it informs the protagonist's motives. All that builds to this aimlessness, heightening the supernatural elements when they pop up. Speaking of, I love that the vampire girl isn't the stereotypical one we see in anime. She's got a lot of personality, rather than the stuck-up princess type barely expressing anything. Basically, she's taking the lead in showing the guy a good time. So, good cast, interesting premise, and a fun story about a guy befriending a vampire to get something out of his boring life. Yeah, another anime by lead in films this season, and they did a really great job at this first episode once again. I think the color is what's most attractive, as it sets the entire mood for this series with a purple tinge to the darks, selling the mystique of this whole vampire thing. But on top of that, the art direction is just strong throughout, making the world feel alive and pop similar to animated movies. Not to mention some overall smooth animation, and a clever use of 3D elements to show the scope of a sprawling cityscape. Probably not a series to sleep on, as it's got personality and a strong cast. So check it out. And lastly, let's take a look at the long-awaited return of Hataraku Maosama. I remember watching the first season when it aired, 
Hell, long before Isekai became the behemoth it is, let alone reverse Isekai. And I really enjoyed the premise at the time, as it hit during the twilight of the Lucky Star clones and endless high school slice of life plaguing the industry. Nine years later in a new studio surely made some of that magic fade, but nonetheless, it's here so let's talk about it. It even starts with a nice little recap for us. Good on them. As the hero was charging down the doors to defeat the Demon Lord, he fled through a portal and ended up in modern Japan, where his magic power is almost non-existent. Now he has to survive by working at a shitty fast food chain, scraping by to make a living, and the hero's still after him. However, she's not faring much better. So the looming shadow over this is, you're in one of two camps. Either you became obsessed with Isekai and were devouring anything related to it, and ended up stumbling upon this franchise in your search. Or you're like me, and have just been in this game for far too long. So how does this season hold up, considering the time gap and entirely new team? Not too great. The new art style feels too rounded and cutesy, cutting down on some of the oomph the characters are meant to exude, especially when they're meant to look kind of intimidating and just mostly look ugly. And even in general, they feel practically off-model. Maybe it's even a bit cheap. Which is surprising, since they resurrected this practically ancient series for a second season, but then again, maybe it also makes sense, since it's not exactly at the height of its popularity, on top of a sense of humor that's run dry. Where the peak of comedy in this first episode was a fucking cockroach. Oh, and the shock of a little girl calling Mao and Emmy her parents. Fucking brilliant. Rather than feeling like a big return, it feels like a hollow cash grab. And that's pretty sad, considering I liked the original series quite a bit. If you watched the first season recently, maybe check this out, but it feels like it's mostly catering to fans of the books, so keep that in mind. So that's it. Summer's here, and the lineup so far has mobility, where not a ton of the first episodes have been must-watches, I'd say, but certainly enough had potential they could swing in any direction. All that's left is to see where it takes us, but let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. But for now though, hey. You've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description. If you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Honorwolf01 for their support. Thanks for watching.